Hello, my name is Amanda Thomas, and I'd like to welcome you to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. This podcast features recordings of talks given at Science on Tap, a series of lectures held in Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington. This episode is a recording of a talk given by David Alloway on the topic Ignoble Rot, Food Scraps as Compost and Energy. David is a senior policy analyst with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, otherwise known as DEQ, and this event was hosted in collaboration with Metro and their Let's Talk Trash series designed to engage the public in discussions about how we as a community dispose of our waste. Food scraps make up the largest part of our waste stream and can go on to produce dangerous greenhouse gases like methane if disposed of in landfills. So in this talk, David describes several different methods for how to deal with leftover food. He also talks about reducing the amount of food waste being produced in general. And there's a bit near the end about compostable packaging that I bet will surprise you. You can find out more about the Let's Talk Trash series and Metro's Solid Waste Roadmap at their website, oregonmetro.gov slash let's talk trash. I've included both David's talk and a couple of audience questions at the end that I thought were really interesting. I've also synced the slides with this audio and uploaded this as an enhanced podcast. So depending on the app you're using to listen, you may be able to see the slides as we go along. Here we go. Thanks. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, Good evening, everyone. It is evening now. And um, I can't see you. This is, I'm, I'm used to giving presentations where I can like see people's faces and see if they're falling asleep or not. So hopefully you'll, you'll stay awake into the wee hours of the night. I understand this program is scheduled to run until two this morning. <laughs> so I prepared about five hours of technical material. Um, so, so I do work at the DEQ, sometimes just shortcut DQ, um, as in the uh, home of the, let's, can I get this to work here? The uh, DQ, the home of the blizzard. Um, so for those of you who like your, your Oreo blizzards or your, your Brazier burgers, I can, I can put those together for you really well. I do not know anything about vehicle inspection. If you're having a hard time getting your tags, don't talk with me about it. That's a different part of DEQ. Um, DEQ is actually a pretty big organization. Um, We uh, have a bunch of different divisions and sections. We do more than uh, inspect vehicles. We uh, permit and inspect uh, uh, facilities uh, for their water and air pollution. We permit solid waste landfills and transfer stations and compost sites to to make sure that pollution is uh, controlled and reduced. We do uh, water and air planning throughout the state. And we have a program called the Materials Management Program where I work. Materials management is the uh, part of DEQ that works on policies and programs that work to reduce the environmental impacts of materials across their entire life cycle, starting with production, resource extraction, and going through use, and finally end-of-life management, recycling, composting, and landfill. Um, We used to be called, this is a little bureaucratic history, but I think like half the people in the room here are from Metro, so you'll appreciate this. We used to be called the Solid Waste Program, um, and the name really wasn't a very good fit for what we do. It was also just a guaranteed deadly way. It was just the worst pickup line. I mean, if you can just imagine, like, like, you know, I'm at a party, and someone says, you know, who are you, blah, blah, blah. And I say, oh, I'm I'm David. I I work at DEQ. What do you do? Oh, I work in the Solid Waste Program. Ew. Like, in my family, solid waste always meant garbage, but apparently for other people it means something else. Um, so we did change our name from solid waste to materials management. When we did that, we lost a number of our corporate sponsors um, who just, like materials management, what does that mean? Um, but um, that's actually not the form of solid waste that I want to talk with you about tonight, although we will go into a little bit into the world of wastewater treatment. I want to talk with you about three interrelated problems. The first problem is the blank slide. There we go. The first problem is the problem of waste. About a fifth of all the garbage that this region sends to the landfill each year is food waste. It's enough to fill about 5,000 long-haul trucks each year. Uh, Landfills are anaerobic. Once you bury the waste and cover it with soil, the, uh, the oxygen is depleted. It turns anaerobic. It's a kind of similar environment to... Um, you know, your nephew's intestine after he's eaten a few too many bean burritos. Kind of a similar biological process goes on, and it produces methane, which is this, this, it's natural gas, um, and it's, uh, it's pretty potent. So while many landfills now capture 
the, uh, they, they try to capture the landfill gas. And um, some of the gas is just burned to destroy its, its uh, harmful effects. Much of it is burned now to produce energy, uh, to displace natural gas, for example, in the, in the energy grid. Um, the rest of the methane escapes to the atmosphere, and it is a very potent greenhouse gas. Those numbers, um, Councillor Harrington, that were different from what you've seen before are because the, the scientists who work on studying the effects of climate continue to reevaluate their numbers, and they recently came out with the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change with new estimates of how potent of a greenhouse gas methane is. It is more potent now than we thought it was just a few years ago, um, so that's why the numbers are different. So while that's bad, um, it, the environmental impact of this waste really pales in comparison to the second of our related problems, which is the impacts of agriculture. From farm to landfill, food in the United States contributes 14% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, domestic greenhouse gas emissions, that is. Most of these emissions are upstream in farming and other agricultural practices. Agriculture in the United States is the largest user of land, the largest user of pesticides, the largest user of water, and the largest source of eutrophying pollutants, the nitrogen and phosphorus that cause, for example, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, are all a consequence of agriculture. The food that we grow and eat has very significant impacts on both renewable and non-renewable resources, as well as overall environmental health. Now, these two problems of waste and agriculture are linked through this topic of food waste. Estimates vary, but somewhere between 25 and 40% of all the food that's grown in the United States never gets eaten, at least not by people. American households spend an estimated $125 billion every year buying food that they don't eat. Globally, if the emissions associated with making and refrigerating and storing and ultimately disposing of food that never gets eaten, if those emissions were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world after China and the United States. So food waste is a very significant problem. And while most people focus on the waste piece, thinking it's about the landfills, it really isn't so much about the landfills. In reality, most of these emissions and most of these environmental impacts are upstream in producing the food. By the time the food gets to your kitchen, most of the environmental damage has been done by a factor of about 10. Um, and it's not just about climate. Uh, you saw the estimate there that approximately a quarter of all the fresh water that's, that's uh, withdrawn in the United States goes to produce food that doesn't get eaten, even while we're, we're in this you know, significant drought in the West. And even before then, we were depleting uh, the Ogallala Aquifer and other major sources of groundwater. So there's some pretty significant challenges here. Both of these problems bring us to our third problem, and that is hunger and food insecurity. Approximately 15% of households in Oregon are experiencing food insecurity, which is up several percentage points from just 10 years ago. And there are many causes of food insecurity, uh, most of them due to economics, but at a time when so many people are so hungry, throwing out so much food does strike a moral co chord with people. Uh, the sort of very obvious connection of people being hungry and, and organizations throwing out at food, some of which is edible. And, and that's really what the Holy Father was referring to in that quote uh, in the trivia element of tonight's program. The less obvious connection, um, but the one that keeps me up at night in terms of food waste and hunger, relates to the long-term loss of soil productivity and its effect on food supplies. Through tilling and other farming practices, we've been mining, essentially mining and eroding our soils. The US loses about 10 times as much topsoil as it creates. We used to lose about 40 times as much, so we've definitely gotten better, but we are still on a net basis depleting our topsoil. Uh, Chad Kruger, uh, a professor at Washington State University, has demonstrated that native soils near Pullman um, have lost between 26 and 73 percent of their carbon due to intensive agriculture. When soils lose carbon, fertility and productivity fall. Water needs and the need to um, supplement the soil with synthetic fertilizers rise. FDR said it best, quote, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. So today, I'd like to talk through with you a few options that can help to reduce these three problems. Not solve them, 
I do not have a silver bullet that's going to solve these problems, but a couple of solutions that will help to reduce them. I'm gonna talk a little bit about prevention, the reduce, reuse part of reduce, reuse, recycle. Focus a bit more on the recycling of food through composting and anaerobic digestion, uh, as well as the benefits and impacts of putting food into landfills. And then I'm gonna close with a little, little touch on compostable packaging, which really isn't about food, but it's a topic which is very interesting to a lot of people, and I have some kind of surprising information to share with you. Well, surprising if you've never heard me talk before, and if you have heard me talk before, I really don't know why you're here. Um, <laughs> but that's your choice, it's a free country. So, so let's, let's move on here. Um, I wanna talk first about, about the reduce, reuse part. Those of you who know the world of solid waste will recognize this as the solid waste hierarchy. Um, reduce first, then recycle. Reducing or preventing waste is the top priority above composting because it has the greatest potential for both environmental and financial savings. So just as an example of this, a few years ago, DEQ um, provided a grant to the city of Hillsborough who worked with Intel and a management consultant um, to work with two Intel cafeterias to look at the, look at the food they were wasting. Um, in the waste world, we distinguish between pre-consumer waste and post-consumer waste. Pre-consumer waste is all the waste that stays in the kitchen. Post-consumer waste is all the waste that comes off of people's plates, okay? So this project was really looking at pre-consumer waste. It's not what most consumers see, but there's, there's a lot of it in food service. And through a series of management tools and measurements and evaluation and then management changes, they were able to reduce the amount of pre-consumer waste by 47% over a 12-month period. Now, we evaluated the greenhouse gas benefits of this waste prevention, and you might say, um, you know, why bother? Because Intel, these two Intel cafeterias, were already composting their food waste. They were already keeping it out of the landfill, right? The waste was never going to the landfill, so we kept waste from, we, we prevented waste from going to the landfill that wasn't going to the landfill anyways. Like, how bureaucratic is that? What's the point? So let me show you the greenhouse gas impact of this. Um, these are metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent um, over the course of a year associated with the food that was subject to this intervention that ultimately was no longer being purchased and wasted by Intel. If the food had been purchased and sent to the landfill, the greenhouse gas emissions would have been about 97 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. In pink, um, or fuchsia, depending on your, your perception of color, I guess, um, are the emissions associated with producing that food, and in green or olive um, are the emissions associated with disposing of it. They weren't doing that. They were composting the food, and so compared to landfilling it, Greenhouse gas emissions were a bit lower, 81 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, all about production and a little benefit associated with composting. What is this benefit? When you take food waste and you compost it, um, some of the carbon is released in the form of carbon dioxide. The rest of it is bound up in fairly complex, fairly stable humic compounds. And this is carbon that used to be up in the atmosphere, okay? It was converted into uh, plants, the plant tissue through photosynthesis, it then goes into the compost pile, it goes into these complex humic molecules, you apply it to soils, particularly if they are soils that have been depleted of their native carbon, and you are putting carbon into the soil. And um, that's what this blue line here is. Now, of course, if you never produced the food in the first place, because you didn't buy it, because you didn't need it, which is what was going on at Intel, you don't have any of these emissions, and so the net greenhouse gas impact of that is zero. So, so Intel had already gone from 97 to 81, we helped them go from 81 to zero. And this is again just, the, just that portion of the food that they're able to avoid buying through, through better purchasing and management practices. So this is just an illustration of why reduce, reuse is so important and so valuable. So, why do we produce so much food waste? What's driving it? Ultimately, the primary driver, I believe, is because food is cheap. By historic standards, uh, we are spending um, the smallest amount of our income that we ever have on food. Back in the, in the first half of the last century, uh, U.S. households were spending around 20% of their disposable income on food. Now it's less than 10% and has been less than 10% for several years now. 
Um, and this is really a consequence of a combination of technological advancements that have brought down the price of food and also federal subsidies um, that are not reflected in this. Um, disposable income doesn't include taxes. Um, so we are paying for food, but we're in, in ways that aren't reflected here. We're paying for food through agricultural subsidies that we, we fund through the income tax. And those subsidies artificially deflate the price of food and, mean, and, and creates an economy which is awash in far more food than we could ever possibly eat. So um, food is cheap. And when things are cheap, we are often careless with them. We're not careless with gold because gold is expensive. But when things are cheap, we, we don't treat them with much respect. Food is wasted across the entire life cycle. Now, where the waste occurs really varies, it turns out, by country. In the United States, about 60% of all the food waste or the wastage of food occurs in people's homes. So it is us as consumers who are the primary responsible parties here. Another 34% or so of food wastage in the US economy occurs in retail settings. Very little of the food wastage occurs on the farm or in the factory. In some other countries, it's reversed. For example, in sub-Saharan Africa, the, the, the rate of wastage of fresh crops is very, very high because they lack refrigeration. So they're harvesting these perishable crops. And unless you can get them to market very quickly, a lot of them spoil and are lost before they get to market. Once people buy them, the food is so valuable to them that it gets eaten and it doesn't get wasted at the household level. So where waste occurs is very much a function of national and local economies. One very peculiar driver of food waste in homes, coming back to the United States, are those ubiquitous use by and sell by dates. Are you familiar with those? Have you seen them when you buy stuff at the store? Um, trivia question we didn't put up here, how many categories of food in the United States are required to have use by or sell by dates? Anybody know? One, yes, there is one category of food which is required by law to have a use by and sell by date. And since you said one, you probably know what it is. Perfect, infant formula, yep. Uh, nothing else is required to have a use by sell by date. They're put there um, by the food manufacturers, either for the convenience of the retailer, or maybe for the convenience of the consumer, or if you're feeling less generous, perhaps as a prod to get people to toss out food and go buy more of it. Um, and certainly this is a driver of food wastage in the United States. There's a lot of food which is perfectly edible that people just toss out um, because it says, oh, it's expired, so people think it must be bad. And people are risk averse, so out goes the edible food. Now, the U.S. is just waking up to this problem of food waste, but we can learn a lot, I think, from the United Kingdom. For about seven years now, the U.K. has benefited from a very broad and concentrated effort to reduce the wasting of food. It's called Love Food, Hate Waste. And they have these different characters here. There's Fish Lady and Potato Head and um, a few other folks there. Um, and what they've done through this campaign is they have reduced the amount of edible food, which has been wasted nationwide by 20% over a five-year period. Love Food, Hate Waste relies on two major strategies. The first is a very broad and very comprehensive outreach campaign, um, outreach to individuals. It networks through thousands of different neighborhood and civic organizations to draw attention to food waste and consumer options to reduce food waste. They even have a searchable online database of hundreds of recipes that are designed to help you eat up leftovers. So you can search by type of leftover to figure out you know, what you could cook next. So that's the consumer-facing element of love, food, hate, waste. But equally important is a producer-facing element um, where the sponsoring organization, it's, it's a group called RAP, um, they research the root causes of food waste and then work with food producers and retailers to try to eliminate this waste at the source. Just one example of this. What they discovered through some waste sorting and waste studies was that there was a fair amount of bread, half-eaten loaves of bread, being tossed out. Why? Well, many households in the UK, as in the US, are very small. They're just one or two-person households. And unless you're a really big carb eater, and a lot of people are moving away from carbs, uh, or you're willing to refrigerate or freeze your bread, which some people do, but some people don't do, it's very hard to get through an entire loaf of bread before it starts to spoil. So here's an easy solution that doesn't require trying to convince 100 million consumers to change their behavior. 
sell smaller loaves of bread, right? So that, that's what they did, is they worked with the bakeries and the retailers to start offering. You could get the standard size loaf or you could get the smaller loaf and the retailers love it because they're still selling bread and they still get markup. And the consumers like it because if they're not gonna eat that much bread, they can take home fresh bread and eat it all before it starts to grow fuzzy green stuff on it. Um, so that's just an example of the sort of work that they've done. Closer to home, communities on the West Coast are also starting to focus on this. This group called the West Coast Forum on Climate and Materials Management has created a U.S. version of Love, Food, Hate, Waste called Food Too Good to Waste. And this um, focuses on five key consumer behaviors that are, that are the most critical ones for reducing food wastage in the home. Um, the first is really sort of a measurement component. They encourage people to put their food waste in like a clear plastic container for a week and weigh it every day, just to get a sense of how much food you're already throwing out and, and understand why. And then from that, to focus on buying what you need. When you, when you go shopping, shop from your cupboard and your refrigerator first, instead of going out to the store and buying everything new. Smart storage, I didn't realize this, but it turns out that certain vegetables and fruits should not be stored next to each other. Um, some, sh some are best stored in the refrigerator, some are not. Smart prep. They recommend that if you go to the store and you buy a head of broccoli or, a, or a, a, a clump of celery intending to eat it as snacks over the week, bring it home and even before you put it in the refrigerator, cut it up and put it in the fridge so it's ready to eat. And then you're much more likely to actually eat it as opposed to it being relegated to the back of the produce store drawer and turning into green goo for three weeks. And then smart saving, actually eating what you buy. And, and one common, one very success, effective strategy here is just to have a certain part of your refrigerator, um, which is the dedicated place where the really perishable stuff goes, and put that in the front, so that when you come home and you're looking for a little something to nibble on, the stuff that's going to go bad sooner is there in front of you, and you're more likely to draw from that. Now, what they found through a series of pilot projects um, implementing these five measures is that households can reduce their preventable food waste by, by over 50% by weight. So um, this is a program I think we're gonna see more of. A couple of cities in the Portland area are rebranding this. You're gonna see it come out this summer as Eat Smart Waste Less. I don't know why. I mean, first it was Love Food, Hate Waste, and then it was Food Too Good to Waste, and now it's Eat Smart, Waste Less. But anyways, they're all doing the same thing. You can go to this website, and, um, and you'll be seeing, if you go to farmer's markets in the Portland area this summer, I guarantee you, you'll be seeing more of this soon. So it's not all just about households. I want to mention two other waste prevention efforts. Um, there's a management consulting company here in the Portland area called Lean Path. They work with, with uh, large food service institutions and businesses throughout the U.S. Uh, to help them reduce their wasting of food. The Intel pilot project that I mentioned earlier uh, worked with Lean Path. And then there's a project that I love called Fork It Over, which focuses a little bit more on landfill avoidance and feeding the hungry but it's still very valuable. It's, it's really easy if you're a restaurant or a grocery store to set aside the dry food, the non-perishable food that for whatever reason you can't sell. The perishable food is the problem because a lot of food rescue organizations, you know, Snowcap and, and you know, food pantries and whatnot, they don't have refrigerated storage. They don't have refrigerated trucks. And so Metro has provided um, close to a million dollars in grant funds to help organizations like the Oregon Food Bank and Snowcap buy that refrigerated equipment so that they can get out to these restaurants and grocery stores and salvage that perishable food, which is generally much more nutritious, and redistribute it back into the, the, um, the homes and the tummies of the people who really need it. Um, and Fork It Over also includes a web-based referral system and assistance to help the businesses that generate food link up with the businesses who can salvage it. So there's a lot of growing activity in this space, although there's still a lot of potential. So that was the non-scientific part of my presentation. If, if you're waiting for the science, here it comes. Um, <laughs> as important as waste prevention is, and it is very important, we're never gonna be able to prevent 100% of our food waste. Um, and there are certain types of food waste that really aren't preventable. I mean, it's pretty hard to prevent eggshells. It's pretty hard to prevent banana peels and watermelon rinds. I know some people eat them. I don't eat watermelon rinds, but you can make pickled watermelon rind. I don't know how much of that you can actually eat, though, um, <laughs> at a certain point. So I want to turn next to the question of how to manage food, food wastes. Specifically, 
I want to compare and contrast for you four different methods that are promoted for managing food wastes in Oregon. These aren't the only four, but they're the four I'm going to talk about the most. The first method is aerobic composting. This is not composting doing this little Jane Fonda thing with, you know. Um, aerobic means it's oxygenated. So this is a, this is a composting process that is in an oxygen-rich environment. Specifically, food waste is mixed with a bulking agent, typically yard debris. It's put into these long rows that are called wind rows. They're mechanically turned on a periodic basis to keep, to keep an oxygen-rich environment. And in this oxygen-rich environment, um, the waste biologically degrade and they're converted to carbon dioxide. And then these long, relatively stable humic molecules that contain large amounts of carbon that can then be put back into soil um, and they improve soil uh, fertility and tilth. The second technology is kind of similar in that it also involves biological degradation. It's called anaerobic digestion. Here you take the food waste and you put it in a sealed, enclosed tank, like a steel tank. And uh, this is the JC Biomethane facility down in Junction City where a lot of the Portland uh, area uh, business food scraps are going. And in this technology, you have a controlled process that's anaerobic. Anaerobic is, is uh, deprived of, of uh, oxygen, uh, free of oxygen gas. The waste degrades, and as it degrades, it produces two different products. It produces methane gas, which is this potent greenhouse gas. But the good news is this is a sealed, enclosed tank. It's very hard for the methane to escape. Most of the methane is captured and then is used as an energy source. The other product that anaerobic digestion produces is a product called digestate, which is, um, depending on the technology, either a slurry or a solid that uh, can be used as a soil amendment. It has some of the, some of the same qualities as compost, uh, or it can be actually used as a feedstock in composting, and you could compost it further. So that's anaerobic composting. The third technology is one that many of you have and may use and may not even think of as being recovery. It's the use of the in-sink grinder. How many of you have those in your homes? How many of you use them? I mean, maybe, maybe not all the time, but occasionally to get rid of stuff. Yeah. So the in-sink grinder takes food and it grinds it up and it puts it down the wastewater pipe along with that other solid waste that I was telling you about at the beginning of my talk. Uh, the, the, the thing that my program at DEQ is no longer associated with. Um, and then wastewater, and it goes to the wastewater treatment plant where there's a fairly complex series of chemical and biological processes that separate the liquids and the solids. Um, some wastewater treatment plants, uh, the, the, the digesters, they capture the methane for energy. The remaining solids, which are called biosolids that come out of this process, are typically land applied, uh, for example, to fields that grow wheat in eastern Oregon. That's where the Portland area's biosolids go to. And then the fourth technology, the one that's actually the most common and the one that accepts most of our food waste, is landfill. It might look from this picture that the food waste is being basically fed to seagulls. Um, actually, most of the food waste is not eaten by seagulls, and many, many landfills, you don't even see much of this anymore. So the food in this approach is picked up with the garbage. You know how this works. The truck drives down your street and you know, picks up the stuff, and it, it takes it off to the landfill, and it deposits the waste in either a large pit or a slope. It's compressed. It's covered with soil. It's compressed some more. It's covered with some more soil, um, and it's allowed to decompose. And this process also produces methane, and I want to talk about methane in a landfill in a bit more detail. Um, so, so these are the sort of four primary methods of managing food waste. There are some other options. Food can be fed to black soldier flies. There's an outfit out in Washington County that's working on this on a pilot scale. Um, I think okay, right. And, and these are not house flies, by the way. Um, and and Jeff, Jeff Goldblum is not involved in this either. That's a different science on tap. He's the guy that always wears the same suit. <laughs> Um, that's a really creepy movie, by the way, <laughs> if you haven't seen it. Um, but the food waste is converted. I mean, basically, the, the flies feed on the food waste, and then they produce larvae, and the larvae crawl out, and then they're fed to chickens. It's animal feed. Um, it's a way of actually reducing the intensity of, of uh, animal um, production. Um, some people have proposed, I actually didn't know about this until someone sent me an email a couple days ago, and you may be in the audience, and if you are, you can tell me more about it, but have proposed using algae to um, do something with food waste. I'm actually not quite sure what it is, but it's been proposed. Um, 
And then Marion County, they burn their garbage, including food waste, to produce electricity. So burning food waste. I do that at home sometimes, not intentionally, but when I leave stuff in the oven for too long. Um, these are the four methods, though, that get the most attention. Um, and there are many concerns around these issues, including in the rush to generate renewable energy and send food waste to anaerobic digestion, the in-sink grinder, or the landfill, are we ignoring the issues of soils? And since we have a hard time siting and locating the compost facilities near the near the metropolitan areas where the food is located, mostly because of odor concerns, are we, in order to drive the food waste long distances to more rurally located composting facilities, are we wasting gasoline, are we wasting fuel, diesel? Each of these options has challenges. Composting, one of the biggest challenges with it is the creation of odors, and um, some compost facility operators do a better job than others at controlling those odors, but if you lived in Washington County or you paid attention to what was going on out there a few years ago with the Nature's Needs facility and, and the political and literal stink um, that that created. Um, really a very serious uh, problem for the neighbors. Um, because of this, it can be difficult to site and locate compost facilities. And so then they typically get, get sited in more rural, remote areas, which then adds to the cost of transportation of getting the feedstocks to them, which makes the economics less viable. There are also concerns around contamination with materials being sent to the compost facility that don't actually compost, and then you end up with stuff in your, in your finished compost that you really don't want. Anaerobic digestion has some of the same challenges with, uh, with aerobic composting. Little less issue around odor because the entire process is contained, but it's a higher technology process. It's more expensive. The capital costs are higher, and, and sometimes you still get into these siting issues and the cost of transportation. In-sink disposals cannot accept all types of food waste. You, there are certain things you, shouldn't, you can't put down your disposal or you'll break them. And even if you could send them down your disposal, some wastewater treatment plants don't want more um, biological demand being sent down the drain. They just can't handle it. So it's really not an option that works well in all communities. And then landfills. As I mentioned, landfills produce methane. It's a very potent greenhouse gas. Many, although not all, landfills capture um, their gas and they burn it to produce energy, but they never capture 100%. And there's a lot of controversy around how much they do capture versus how much leaks out. So let's explore that for just a moment. This is sort of a crude diagram of a carbon mass balance for a landfill. You have wastes, both degradable and non-degradable wastes, containing carbon being deposited into the landfill. And here in the landfill, some of the carbon remains in the landfill the lignin, the biomass, uh, cellulose, a lot of it stays in the landfill. It, it never degrades, or it, it, it doesn't degrade over, you know, it takes thousands of years for it to degrade. Some of the, a little bit of the, um, the carbon uh, comes out of the landfill and leachate. Le leachate is the, um, is the liquid that drains out the bottom of the landfill as rainwater or snow melt percolates through the landfill and it comes out the bottom. Landfills these days collect leachate um, they either treat it or they um, reapply it back in the landfill for the purpose of speeding up degradation because how quickly waste degrade in landfills is partially a function of um, moisture and in a very dry landfill, the wastes are very slow to degrade. Now, whether you want the waste to degrade or not is sort of a very important question, um, but for landfills that are trying to speed up the degradation of wastes, uh, leachate recirculation is one way to do that. Uh, the wastes will, uh, for those wastes that will degrade, they will produce methane, CH4, carbon dioxide, and volatile organic compounds. This, these gases, um, landfills attempt to capture them by essentially putting in a series of pipes throughout the landfill. Some of the pipes run horizontally, some of the pipes run vertically. It's like this massive distributed vacuum, essentially, and then they turn on the vacuum and it, it, it sucks, tries to suck the gas out of the waste. And then the gas is collected, and then it's either just flared, it's just burned, um, and that's just to destroy the methane and uh, convert it to carbon dioxide to, to reduce its greenhouse gas effect, or it's sent off to an energy plant um, and it's burned to produce energy. Landfill gas capture really got going about 30 years ago because landfills have a nasty habit when they produce methane um, some of the methane comes out the surface of the landfill, but some of the methane migrates. It goes this way or it goes this way. 
And uh, there have been instances of neighboring properties, uh, you know, people who live next to landfills who have had, um, there was one case actually where a woman turned on her, turned on her, her oven on Thanksgiving morning to cook her turkey and her house blew up um, because the concentrations of methane that it, that it saturated over, it leaked over from the landfill were so high. So typically landfills do a lot of landfill gas capture around the perimeter to keep the landfill from migrating offsite. And now increasingly there's gas capture along the surface and in the landfill mass as well. So how good are these gas capture systems at capturing the gas? Do they capture 20%, 80%? 99%? We have one landfill that actually told us they captured 105% of their methane. I don't quite know how they did that. Um, the thing is, is that no one really knows, and here's why nobody knows. Um, it's really difficult to measure gas emissions from a landfill because you have this, this huge area, and then you have the area outside the landfill, and you have little just bits and dribs and drabs of methane percolating up through the surface through this vast area. How do you measure that? And uh, the joke in the solid waste world is the, is the best time to measure it is on a windy day. You can go out with your little monitor and you won't find any methane at all because <laughs> it's all just blown away. Um, so how much gas is actually being emitted depends on how much gas is being produced. It depends on how efficient your vacuum system is at vacuuming the gases up. It depends on how much gas is migrating offsite. It depends on oxidation. Oxidation is this biological process, whereas methane percolates up through the, through the oxygenated surface of the landfill, up at the very top where the, where the plants are growing, or maybe there's been a layer of compost applied. The, the compost it will, can actually convert some of the methane back to carbon dioxide. And so how effective your, your landfill surface is at oxidizing methane and converting it back to CO2 all, depend, all affect how much gas is emitted. The big variable here, though, is how much gas is produced. How much gas is produced, in turn, depends on how much waste you have in the landfill, what the waste is, because different kinds of waste produce different amounts of methane, how wet the landfill is, and how hot the landfill is. And landfills are not these sort of you know, evenly distributed masses. They're very, they've got hot spots in them, they've got wet spots, they've got dry spots. So it's very, very difficult to predict how much gas a landfill is producing. All we ever really know is how much gas they're collecting because the gas that gets collected and gets sucked up through these vacuums, that can be measured, but that's about the only thing that's easy to measure. So it's a big debate in this world, how, what percentage of the gas that's produced actually gets collected. And we care about that because if it's not collected, it's either oxidized, which is good, or it's emitted to the environment. And that's where we have our, our concerns around greenhouse gases. So there's a big uncertainty here. And I wish I had the perfect answer for you, but this is a area of science that is not resolved. So we are spending tens of millions of dollars uh, every year managing this waste stream. And we ought to know what the environmental impacts of these different management options are. We have landfill operators claiming that their landfills are carbon neutral. Uh, we have, um, when the nature's needs compost facility scaled back and stopped accepting commercial food waste and the food waste started being shipped down to the anaerobic digester in Junction City. Um, the Oregonian newspaper led with the tagline, Portland food waste program expands carbon footprint. Uh, really implying that this was a bad thing to be shipping our food waste down to Junction City. Now, never mind that the alternative was to send the food waste to the landfill in Arlington, Oregon, which is just as far as Junction City. For some reason, the popular wisdom was that shipping the food waste to an AD facility far from Portland was inherently a bad thing. So last year, DEQ commissioned some research to better understand the environmental impacts of these different waste technologies. And it's this study that I'm going to share a little bit with you next. The funding for the study was provided by Metro, but the study was managed by DEQ and was led by a contractor, managed by a contractor team that was led by Dr. Jeffrey Morris. So the primary method by which we study the environmental impacts of these technologies is called life cycle analysis, or LCA, not lifestyle analysis. 
life cycle analysis. This is a quantitative accounting of all the resources that are used and all the pollution that's emitted over the life or life cycle of a material. Typically, life cycle analysis or LCA is used to evaluate a specific material, like a paper or grocery bag or a plastic grocery bag, for example. But LCA can also be used to evaluate a process, such as managing food waste via composting or anaerobic digestion. When we looked, we found that there were more than 100 papers that, that claimed to be LCAs that were already published on this topic, the environmental impacts of food waste management. And so rather than adding just one more new LCA to the mix, our study was designed to just evaluate the existing literature. So that doesn't sound too, too hard, like just read the 100 papers and come to a conclusion. But the problem is, is that most of these studies cannot be compared with each other. Here's an example. This graph here shows the range of greenhouse gas impacts that were reported in the literature. It, it turns out that many of those 100 papers were not actually LCAs or they weren't usable to us for a variety of reasons. But we did find a number of papers that reported the carbon footprint of different methods of managing food waste. This line here is the zero line. Everything above this is a, is a net emission of greenhouse gases. Everything below this is a net reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. This is metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per metric ton of food waste. So the literature on aerobic composting gave us results that were all the way over here. Some of the studies said that aerobic composting increases greenhouse gas emissions. Some of them said it decreased. Here's the results of the literature for anaerobic digestion, the in-sink grinder, and the landfill. So if you have all these studies and you just randomly picked two of them out of the hopper, and you picked this landfill study and this aerobic composting study, you would conclude that landfilling has a lower carbon footprint than aerobic composting. But are these two studies representative? Are they typical? Or more importantly, can you actually compare them? Because you can imagine when you do one of these life cycle studies, there's a lot of assumptions that go into them. And what we found was a tremendous amount of inconsistency. For example, some studies included in their analysis the actual carbon emissions associated with making the concrete that was used in the, in the facility to lay the pad, and other studies didn't. So if you have one study that includes the impacts of building the facility and another study that doesn't, those aren't comparable. Some studies would count the impacts of driving the collection trucks around. Some studies wouldn't. Some studies would assume that any electricity that was produced was displacing coal. Others assumed it was displacing natural gas. Well, those aren't comparable. So really, what we have here is an incredible mess. So for this study, what we did, what we had our contractor do, was to find as many existing relevant LCAs on each of the treatment technologies as possible and then adjust them to harmonize them to try to iron out some of these methodological differences, to fill in calculations for those that were missing. Um, for example, some studies included the impacts of collecting the food waste and others didn't. So for studies that were missing those, we added those numbers in, okay, to try to get these studies a little bit more consistent. Um, at the same time, we wanted to preserve the underlying differences caused by local variables, because you can imagine if you, if you, if you forced too much harmonization onto the studies, you would force all the results into a single data point, right? If you made all the studies use exactly all the same assumptions, you would get exactly the same result at the end of the day. So that's sort of pointless. So we were trying to harmonize where it seemed appropriate to harmonize on these variables here. If some studies included carbon storage, we wanted all the studies to include carbon storage. Um, and that's, again, the carbon that gets stored in the landfill or gets stored in the compost. We wanted consistent global warming potentials. That's the issue. How much more potent of a greenhouse gas is methane relative to carbon dioxide? It's important to use the same number. Include the impacts of collection. We did not include the impacts of facility construction. And then the displacement of fertilizer, peat, and grid electricity. This is an interesting one where we were also trying to bring Oregon-specific conditions. Most of this literature comes from Europe, or if it's from the US, it uses US average conditions. Well, we're not quite like Europe in some ways. Um, for example, if we have a landfill that's taking food waste and producing methane gas and burning that methane and generating electricity, it's displacing some other source of electricity somewhere. What's the greenhouse gas benefit of that? Well, to answer that question in this study, we used an Oregon average marginal grid mix um, to, to estimate the, the greenhouse gas benefit. Another important one is the utilization of compost and digestate. How do people actually use the compost? And what's the benefit of that? We don't really have a very good understanding of how compost gets used. Um, but in Oregon, it's different than, say, in, in California. In California, 
um, most of the compost is used in agriculture, in growing crops. And in California, one of the big benefits of using compost in agriculture is that compost conserves uh, soil moisture, and so it reduces the amount of ir irrigation that's needed. Now, in California, this is super beneficial, not only because California is in a <laughs> terrible drought, but also because California has some of the most greenhouse gas intensive water in the world. If you think about how California gets its water, it pumps it you know, several thousand feet over mountains to get it down into the Central Valley, uses electricity. The, the California water system is the largest single user of electricity in the entire state. So water in California has an incredibly high carbon footprint and conserving water and reducing water use is one way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In Oregon, it's a little different story. Most of our compost is used in landscaping applications. It may or may not reduce the, the demand for irrigated water. And most of our water here is gravity fed. It flows down from the mountains. It has a very low carbon footprint. So the greenhouse gas benefit of water conservation through compost use in Oregon is not the same as it is in California. So that's another, another example of how we're adjusting results. So let's look at some results here. Okay, so this is climate impact. The pink bars you've seen before, these were the results before harmonization. The red bars are the results after harmonization. So you can see actually that when we harmonized the results, some of them didn't change very much, others did. The black bar here is the mean for the different studies, and here's the means as well. So what do we conclude from this? Again, this is the zero line, everything below zero is a net reducer of greenhouse gas emissions. Anaerobic digestion is uh, probably the winner by this measure. Um, even in the worst case, anaerobic digestion ekes out at just barely carbon neutral. In most cases, the literature suggests it's a net reducer of greenhouse gas emissions. Compost um, probably comes in second, although it's got a pretty wide distribution here. On average, it's a net reducer of greenhouse gas emissions, although not by as much. The in-sink grinder, um, uh, slight increase in greenhouse gas emissions. The landfill, you know, the, in the best case, the landfill did come out at carbon neutral, so it is possible to be down here in the best case landfill conditions, although it's also possible to be up here, which is pretty bad in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So to explore this a little bit further, let me show you the contribution analysis. These are the same, um, these are those red bars I showed you before, but this time I'm, I'm expanding them to show you where in the life cycle the greenhouse gas emissions occur. And this is pretty interesting. Aerobic composting, again, which is taking the food and food waste and mixing it with a bulking agent, converting it to compost, and then land, and then applying it. Um, it has some emissions from processing. This is mostly the fuel that's used in, to run the equipment. Um, blue here is collection and transport. These are the emissions from picking up the food waste and driving it to the compost facility. But then composting also reduces emissions. This big green bar here is carbon storage. This is that biological carbon that's, that's locked up in the humic compounds that gets applied to soil. Um, purple is the benefit of, 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 of displacing fertilizer. So in some instances, although not all, when people apply compost, they reduce their purchases of, of synthetic fertilizer. The production of synthetic fertilizer emits greenhouse gases. So if you buy less synthetic fertilizer, you're reducing those manufacturing emissions. So that's here in purple. And then this gray number here is, is peat displacement. In certain applications, especially nurseries, compost is used instead of peat. Peat moss, um, mining peat moss is a, is a horribly carbon intensive activity. Uh, it just emits large amounts of methane to the environment. So reducing the use of peat um, is a great thing to do. The, the manager of this project, by the way, his name was also Peat, and we had a lot of fun when we talked about displacing Peat. Although he didn't appreciate that, but anyways. Um, so, so there's compost. Here's anaerobic digestion, kind of a similar story of fewer processing emissions. Again, very few collection and transport emissions. People really think that you know, composting and anaerobic digestion just can't, it just can't make sense to have this extra truck driving down the street, burning fuel, picking up food waste and driving it you know, 50 or 100 or 150 miles off to some composting facility. In the big picture of things, collecting and transporting the wastes really don't add much to the total, at least from greenhouse gases. Um, anaerobic digestion also, it produces that digestate, so you get carbon storage, a little bit of fertilizer and peat displacement, but the big benefit for AD is an electricity displacement. Again, you're producing methane gas in a controlled environment. It's a tank, okay? 
It's not escaping. You're capturing the methane, you're burning it, you're generating electricity and displacing the combustion of coal or natural gas or some other fossil fuel in the system. So that's where most of the benefit is. The in-sync grinder, it turns out, has pretty significant processing emissions. These are the, ener the emissions associated with the energy used to run the wastewater treatment plant and the fugitive methane emissions from the wastewater system. Some of the food waste turns anaerobic in the pipe be before, it even gets to the, to, before it even gets to the wastewater treatment system. You start getting methane production throughout the system and you have emissions there. The big benefit of the in-sync grinder is that some of the wastewater treatment plants are doing methane capture and they're generating electricity. And then we have the landfill. And with the landfill, you have a significant benefit of carbon storage. This is the portion of the food that doesn't degrade and remains in the landfill. You have electricity displacement from the methane that's captured and burned to produce electricity. Notice that the electricity displacement for the landfill is not as good as it is for the in-sink grinder or the anaerobic digestion. That's because these are more controlled environments and they're able to capture a higher percentage of the methane. The landfill captures a smaller percentage of the methane. The rest of the methane escapes and that's what most of this red bar is here, is the fugitive emissions from the landfill, um, the methane that's going up into the atmosphere. These are energy impacts. Um, so with energy, again, let's look at the dark blue, which is the results post-harmonization. Aerobic composting doesn't do very well. It, it doesn't really save very much energy. It uses energy, it doesn't save much. Anaerobic digestion, this was really an odd case where the, and it was very strange there was only one piece of literature we could find that, that um, met our criteria. And when we did harmonization, the results um, went from being a net producer of energy to a net user of energy, although it's still fairly low. The in-sync grinder comes out the best, and the landfill is sort of in the middle there in terms of its energy impact. So from an energy perspective, these technologies are the best, followed by the landfill, and then aerobic composting scores last. Now, the one other type of environmental impact we looked at in our study was the impacts on soils. Now, soil impacts are a little bit harder to evaluate, um, and they're very, very complicated. In the U.S., however, decline of carbon in soils um, has been accompanied by a decrease in soil fertility and functionality, and it has very far-reaching impacts because when you have lower-quality soils, you get lower yields per acre, so which re either requires more acreage and production to produce the same amount of food or more intensive production, more synthetic fertilizers. Um, and the decline in soil quality is due in large part to the losses of soil carbon. Um, soil carbon has impacts not only on concentrations of carbon in the atmosphere, but also how functional soils are. And as soil quality and functionality decreases, then you increase fertilizer use, you increase water consumption, uh, you decrease yield, and that in turn impacts greenhouse gas emissions and energy use. Just because these impacts are really hard to quantify doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't try to or that they're not important. So what we did in this study was we looked at four different types of soil impacts. So carbon benefits, fertilizer replacement, water conservation, and yield increase. And one of the members of the consultant team, Dr. Sally Brown at the University of Washington, did a qualitative ranking of these different um, technologies. Uh, here in this case, five is the optimal benefit, zero is no benefit. And when you look at the different soil impacts, her conclusion was that aerobic composting and anaerobic digestion have the highest benefits to soil quality. In-sink grinder mm, comes out sort of in the middle, and landfill has relatively little benefit to soils, which makes sense when you think about it. So here are the final conclusions of the study, ranking the four food waste treatments uh, where one is best and four is worst. Anaerobic digestion in this study sort of comes out as consistently at or near the top in terms of the different types of environmental impacts we were evaluating. Aerobic composting is also quite good except for energy. Um, not, there's no energy savings from aerobic composting or very little energy savings. The in-sync grinder uh, is consistently comes in third, except for energy, uh, where it seems to be the best, and then the landfill consistently came in last. So that's not to say that there's no benefit to sending the food waste to the landfill, because there is some benefit. The landfills are capturing some energy from it. Um, and it's easy and convenient, because you don't have to separate anything. You can just mix it all together and 
send it off to the landfill. But there are some different methods of managing these food wastes, which on average, based on this study, would yield reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, improvements in soil, and reductions in energy use. So where are we? We're getting close to the end. I want to change gears one last time and um, talk for a few minutes about compostable and degradable packaging. So having established that composting is, has several advantages over landfilling, and that degradable waste in landfills produces methane, which can be used to generate energy, compostable or degradable packaging might sound like a good idea. The question is, is it? In popular wisdom, it certainly is, but I want to um, dispel a few myths this evening. Before we go there, I want to get clear on a couple of terms, because um, there's a lot of confusion on this topic. Um, the first is that compostable and degradable are not the same. The environment in a compost pile is hot, aerobic, and wet. And most compost facilities turn material over in a fairly short time period, weeks to months, not years. So if something is going to compost, it has to degrade in an environment that's hot, aerobic, wet, and it has to degrade quickly. Degradability can actually mean degradable in the landfill or degradable just as litter. Like, you know, if you toss something out of your car window and it sits there on the side of the road, is it going to degrade? Those are, again, two very different environments. Landfills can be hot. Sometimes they're cool. They're anaerobic. Um, depending on the landfill, it can be high moisture or low moisture. And, of course, you have a long time when it's in a landfill. So compostability and degradability are not the same. The other thing that people get caught up on is people assume that if something, if you have a packaging material that's made from a plant, it's compostable, and if it's not made from a plant, it's not compostable or not degradable, and that's also not necessarily true. There's all these different packaging materials, you know, food boxes and, and forks and spoons and whatnot that are, that are made from plants. They're bio-based, but not all bio-based materials actually compost or degrade. We also have some conventional fossil-based plastics that have metals added to them that speed up degradation. If you've ever been to the farmer's market and you pick up that plastic bag and it says oxo-degradable, that's a conventional plastic bag made from natural gas or petroleum that has some metals added to it that cause it to break down and degrade. And people assume that's a good thing, um, although potentially it isn't. In the case of those plastic bags, if you were to recycle them, Think about it for a moment. You take a plastic bag that has an additive in it that's designed to break down, to break chemical bonds when exposed to sunlight or oxygen, and you take that plastic, you send it off to the recycling center, the recycler sells it to some company who uses it to make house siding, <laughs> or decking, or clothes, <laughs> and they start degrading when exposed to oxygen or sunlight, that's a pretty bad deal. It has the plastics industry, the plastics recyclers, very, very concerned about the long-term viability of their business. If they start selling recyclate to other businesses that cause products to fail, that's not a viable business model. So let's come back to compostable packaging. And I want to give you one example, which is a plastic made from corn, um, PLA, or polylactic acid. Who, who here in the room has heard, has heard of it, has heard of PLA? Okay. It's a very common bioplastic. You'll, you can find a lot of it, for example, at a Whole Foods. Um, and it's one of the most common bioplastics and compostable plastics used in the US. This plastic happens to be a bioplastic and it's compostable. If you put it in a hot commercial compost facility, it will, it will break down. The primary material feedstock used to make this plastic is corn. And again, it will compost. It only degrades in hot conditions. So if you toss it out your car window, it won't degrade. If you put it in the landfill, if the landfill goes hot, it will degrade, and if the landfill doesn't, it won't. So we evaluated PLA a few years back as part of a larger life cycle analysis study that evaluated different methods of delivering drinking water. So here we're looking specifically at a single-use bottle made from PLA. The U.S. producer of PLA, NatureWorks, no longer allows PLA to be used in drinking water bottles. They used to. They don't allow it anymore. So this example is no longer a commercially available example. It's a little bit more academic, but I think you'll find it interesting nonetheless. So we looked at a bunch of different environmental impacts, and I'll share just a few of them with you. 
Again, this is an evaluation of impacts over the entire life cycle. Producing the fertilizer, growing the corn, harvesting the corn, shipping it to the mill, milling it, shipping the starch to the, the refinery, operating the refinery, producing the resin, converting the resin to a plastic bottle, shipping the plastic bottle to a bottling plant, producing the water, filling the bottle, making the cap, screwing the cap on, putting it in the box, putting it in the truck, putting it at the grocery store, you driving it to the grocery store, you drinking out, putting it in the refrigerator, and you drinking out, and then you put it in the recycling center, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so all of those impacts are evaluated in the study. And um, that's how I feel at work, often, actually. Um, and so we're evaluating this PLA bottle under two different scenarios. One is where the PLA bottle is disposed of and it just goes off to the landfill. The other would be if 62% if, if of the bottles somehow or another were separated and they were sent off to be composted. We're comparing it against a PET or polyethylene terephthalate, a conventional, um, you know, derived from, a conventional plastic derived from petroleum or natural gas. Again, recycled at a rate of 62%. Why 62%? This is the rate at which water bottles are captured under the Oregon Bottle Bill. This is the statewide recycling rate for water bottles. 62% of water bottles get diverted and sent off to recycling markets. So if the PLA in water bottle were being sold in Oregon, which it isn't, if it were separated just as well as they were for recycling, if it didn't contaminate the recycling, if the PLA bottles all got sent off to a compost facility, 62% would be composted and the rest would go to landfill. So a couple of interesting things here. First of all, you'll notice that for each of these three graphs, there are some dark colors and there are some very light colors up here on the top. Sorry, they're very hard to see. Those light colors are the environmental impacts of disposal. These dark colors are the environmental impacts upstream of the consumer, okay? So as with most consumer products, most of the environmental damage is done before you ever buy it. The impacts are upstream in production. This is ecotoxicity. This is a, this is a blend of different pollutants that harm invertebrates and fish and frogs and things like that. Um, notice that there is no difference between whether you send the PLA off to the landfill or you compost 62% of it and send the remainder off to the landfill. Why is that? Well, PLA in a compost pile does something rather unusual. It doesn't, act, it doesn't actually compost. It rather degrades, which means it doesn't produce any compost. It dissolves. Well, it dissolves the wrong word. That's not very scientific. It degrades into carbon dioxide and water, which is really cool if you're like a magician and you want to make things disappear, <laughs> okay? but it sort of violates the basic premise of composting. Why do we compost? Why do we use compost? We use compost to capture carbon, we use compost to improve soil tilth, fertility, we put it on our gardens to reduce water loss, we use it to displace fertilizers, but if you take something and you put it in a compost pile and it doesn't produce any compost, what's the point, right? So I have friends who say that composting PLA is zero waste. I'm of the opinion that composting PLA is actually a total waste. <laughs> because you take all the energy, all the impacts of making this stuff, you send it off to the compost facility and you destroy all of it. If you could recycle it and keep it in circulation and use it to make more PLA instead of the whole process of growing more corn and running it through the refinery and driving the trucks, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff, you'd have some environmental benefits. That's how recycling works. You conserve value. You reduce pollution. But composting PLA is a valueless proposition. And that's why there's no difference. It doesn't matter whether you dispose of it or you compost it from an ecotoxicity perspective. But if you care about bugs and frogs and whatnot, the compostable, um, plant-based plastic does have lower impacts than the conventional petroleum-derived plastic. However, materials affect the environment in many different ways. Another environmental impact is eutrophication. It would be a great Scrabble word, except you'd have to have way too many tiles. Eutrophication is nitrogen and phosphorus loading into water bodies is what causes algae blooms. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, are you familiar with that? Okay, that's eutrophication, okay? It's caused by nutrients running off from the corn belt and the, and the, the U.S. Midwest down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico and, and depleting the oxygen in the Gulf and destroying, I mean, just killing anything that's living there. 
Well, PLA is made from corn grown in the Midwest, so it should come as no surprise that if you care about eutrophication, this is a pretty bad material. Notice again, however, that the impacts of landfilling and composting are exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether you landfill or compost it because there's, it makes no difference. Now finally, greenhouse gases, and this one is a bit mind-bending, so fasten your seat belts here. We don't, do these seats come with seat belts? I don't think they do. <laughs> We don't know if, we don't actually know how PLA behaves in the landfill. Does it degrade or does it not degrade? The general public believes that we want waste to degrade in landfills. Popular awareness in this country tends to lag scientific awareness by about 30 years, okay? <laughs> so 30 years ago, we had a landfill capacity crisis. Metro had a landfill capacity crisis. We were literally running out of places to put our garbage and it created this perception that we were running out of places to put our garbage and so we want all of our waste to degrade because we want to conserve our landfills. As if they're like whales or spotted owls or something. But <laughs> landfills in Oregon, we have hundreds of years of landfill capacity. Now we didn't 30 years ago, but we have hundreds of years of landfill capacity. We're not gonna run out of places to put our garbage. We don't need the waste to degrade to conserve landfill space, but the public thinks we do. But what happens when wastes degrade? In landfills, they produce methane. So if the PLA goes into the landfill and it produces methane, then it has the worst carbon footprint. And this is after um, some of the methane is captured and burnt to, to produce energy. If the methane, excuse me, if the PLA is composted, then the carbon footprint is lower, although the conventional plastic still has the lowest carbon footprint, even though it's not made from plants. Now, what if the PLA doesn't degrade in the landfill? So here, I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about this corn-based plastic. If it doesn't degrade in the landfill, then what you've done is you've taken, this is carbon storage right here. You've taken carbon that used to be up in the atmosphere. Through photosynthesis, you've converted it into corn sugars. You've then taken that carbon and made it into this resin. You've put it into the, the plastic water bottle. You've put the plastic water bottle on the landfill. If it just sits there and it doesn't degrade, and there's some evidence that it doesn't, then you've taken carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back under the surface of the earth. This is the opposite of global warming, right? In global warming, what we're doing is we're taking carbon that used to be under the surface of the earth in the form of coal or natural gas, and we're burning it, and we're putting the carbon back up into the atmosphere. This is the opposite of that. It's reversing greenhouse gases. So if PLA doesn't degrade in the landfill, then compostable PLA has the lowest carbon footprint, but only if you don't compost it. <laughs> I, I am miserable. I mean, I, had to, I have to like see a therapist about this and DEQ won't even pay for it. So, it's, but this is what the science tells us. So, um, so there it is. <laughs> of course, there is more that goes into these decisions about what we should use as packaging materials than just the environmental impacts. There's also some practical considerations. What compost facilities and anaerobic digestion facilities need as feedstock is they need high value feedstock like this. This is food. This is great stuff for them. They can work magic on this, okay? They can produce energy, they can produce compost, they can improve soil fertility. If they get this. When composting programs accept compostable packaging, unfortunately, they don't get this. They get that. That's what shows up. And not all of it composts, even though it's certified and it has no value to the anaerobic digestion facility. They can't break this stuff down. This is, this is a pure nuisance to them. And so if you put this stuff into a compost operation, what you get is finished compost is you get that, okay? Without the little signs on it that say spoon, fork, and plate, okay? <laughs> um, I don't want that in my garden, and so this is a real serious threat to the composting industry, and, and the anaerobic, the, the, the facility down in Junction City, the AD facility, just can't handle it at all. So that's why, if you've been following the news, Metro recently announced that it would no longer be accepting non-food packaging materials in the um, region's commercial food waste program because it's just creating too much of a problem. So in conclusion, food, how we waste it and how we manage those wastes has very profound impacts on energy, climate, water, soils, and even human welfare. And I wanna close with just a little story. 
DEQ is proposing to bring a scaled down version of the UK's Love Food Hate Waste Program to Oregon, all of Oregon, not just the metro region. We've been discussing this with some folks across the state and recently we're talking about it with a representative of one of Oregon's tribal nations. Um, he lit up when, when we got to this particular uh, project and, and this is what he said. He said, the tribe will be very interested in and supportive of work to, to manage and reduce food wastes. Our members understand that food is sacred. It is a sacred gift that makes life possible. We should never take it for granted. And if the state of Oregon were to get serious about reducing the wasting of food, it would be a sign that you are becoming more civilized. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. That was fascinating. Uh, hopefully we'll get the lights back up uh, and we have some time for questions. Yes. So I'm going to start out with a question. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, so plastic packaging, compostable packaging, What if I get takeout, what should I do? Or just not get takeout? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, so it's a really... It's a really hard question to answer. The, the comp compostable packaging, it's this huge universe of materials. I mean, we, we like to think of it all packaging as packaging, or plastic is plastic. Well, plastic is not plastic. There's lots of different resins. They have different environmental impacts. Compostable packaging is the same way. There's lots of different resins, materials made from different feedstocks, made in different methods that, that, that respond in different ways at end of life. And frankly, we don't know the answer to that question. It has not been sufficiently evaluated. It is, it is a major source of frustration for me that um, so much of the discussion around compostable packaging has been about the impact on the composters. I mean, that's a very legitimate concern, and yet people seem to be making recommendations about whether you should use this material or that material based solely on the fact of whether or not it composts. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, if we really want to make good choices, we need to do the research to understand what those environmental impacts are. We're proposing to do more of that. Um, but it just has not been done in a way that's, that I can give you a, an, an answer that I'm, I'm comfortable with. Having said that, packaging. We, Americans, Oregonians, we love to hate packaging. We really do. Packaging is the thing you bring home from the store that you never wanted, right? You wanted the product. But the packaging is this thing that's left over, and you have to manage it as garbage. It's very visible. Visible. We have a very sort of visceral response to it, and so we put a lot of we have a lot of angst about packaging. Less packaging is generally a very good thing. Someone said zero packaging or less packaging, and that's generally a very good approach, um, with one exception, and that is if less packaging translates into higher product waste. Because when we look at the life cycle of packaged goods, we typically find that the impact of the product is oftentimes 10 times higher than the impact of the packaging. Okay, the packaging is, has become a bit of a red herring and is distracting us from reducing the environmental impacts of the products, in my view. And if you make packaging so small and so lightweight that you start damaging the product and you start wasting product, for example, during distribution or in retail, then you can end up doing more harm than good. You're being penny wise and pound foolish. So I don't have a great answer for you. It's an interesting question. The most important thing when it comes to reducing the environmental impacts of materials, though, and specifically your question around food, is to focus on the food. The food is much more impactful than the packaging is. So has anyone studied the environmental impact of all of us having chickens? Because, because we don't throw anything into any of your streams <laughs> at all. They even re-eat their eggshells. Um, yeah, quite possibly someone has evaluated that. I haven't seen it. It's a, it's a fine question. Um, I know it, at one point, um, many years ago, under a different regime, for those of you Metro councilors in the room, um, Metro was, 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 was trying to figure out how to count more waste towards its recovery rate. And there was interest in counting the feeding of food scraps to animals. 
there was a proposal to do a study of how much food scraps metro area residents were feeding to their animals so that we could count it towards our recovery rate. The study got sent over to, to my desk and, and I wrote back that one would have to subtract out the, the, the mass of fecal production um, because that's a waste that results from the feeding of the food waste to the animals. You used to do this mass balancing and these emails started flying back and forth about how we would study how much food waste and how much dog poop is created. And, and then at a certain point, I wrote back as like, sure hope the Oregonian never requests this record. <laughs> and that was the end of the conversation. It just stopped. So. I live in Portland, and Portland has the uh, curbside compost pickup, which I'm really glad about. Except I live in an apartment downtown, and um, there's no uh, curbside compost pickup for people who live in large, any kind of apartment complex that I know of. So I bring my compost to a friend's house. I don't use a car, I take it on the bus in a bucket. Because he does have curbside. But there are a But there are a lot of people in Portland that live in apartments. And um, they probably don't go to that kind of trouble. So what can we do for people in apartments to get them compost pickup? I think, I think if there's anyone in the room from TriMet, I think they should get right on that. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, is there anyone from the city of Portland here who'd like to speak to that? So first of all, um, there are apartment complexes in um, Portland that are composting food scraps. There's about 200 communities that are doing that already. And it really depends on um, your complex. So your manager of your building um, contracts with um, the garbage and recycling collection company and sets up the service that they want to provide. And they can add compost um, collection if, if that's something they're interested in doing. Um, usually when we work with communities, we there's certain things that we want them to do. Um, we want them to reach out to the residents ahead of time and um, make sure that there's a certain number of people that are going to be on board because um, it really won't work if the residents of the building aren't, aren't super on board and super excited about it. So, But we're happy to talk to you about um, how you can get composting going in your building if you want. But it's more complex. There's a lot of different types of buildings and sizes of buildings and how does the waste get collected. And so it's a lot more um, homogenous in single-family houses. I have spent a fair amount of money on compostable serviceware hmm. um, at home, at my church, family events. So you've kind of busted my bubble tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could tell us how you really feel about it <laughs> or if there's anything good or redeeming about it at all. Well, thank you. Yeah, there, there is something. So again, I can't speak to the environmental benefits of compostable. Because compostable is so big, there's so many different types. It's sort of like asking me to speak about the quality of people who live in Idaho, <laughs> okay? I mean, you know, there's some nice people who live in Idaho and there's some not so nice people who live in Idaho, okay? So I, it's sort of hard to draw generalizations about it. In the PLA example that I shared, the compostable PLA, there's no clear winner. But the compostable PLA has some environmental benefits that, that have nothing to do with composting. It's, it's because of how it's made. So there are some, you don't, you don't feel bad about using the compostable, but maybe feel good because of what the material is in the first place and how it's made. It may have a lower environmental impact. I can't guarantee for you that it does because I don't know what it is and I haven't seen it studied. Um, my, my point here, and, and I'm sorry if, it, if it's making people uncomfortable, um, actually it, it, I could do a whole other evening talk about this maybe sometime in the future, but my point here is that for the last 30 years in this country, we have made, let me step back. If, if as producers and consumers, we want to reduce the environmental impacts of materials, well, then what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce actual environmental impacts. We're trying to reduce loading of toxicity into the environment, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we're trying to reduce water consumption, et cetera. So in an ideal world, we would 
evaluate materials for those environmental impacts. We would measure them, and then we would make our decisions accordingly. But that's not how we do things in this country. Because it's so hard to do, and it used to be very difficult, it's become much easier in the last five or 10 years, but because it's so hard and so out of reach for consumers, we rely on attributes. We go with things that are compostable or recyclable or bio-based or local under the hope and the assumption that those attributes correlate with actual reductions in environmental impacts. Because what else can we do? I mean, we have limited bandwidth. We have to make quick decisions. We're not gonna go out and commission these $50,000 studies to figure out what sort of serving where to serve at your church. And so we use these attributes. What I'm sharing with you is the attributes, and I have many other examples of this, the attributes aren't very good. They are not good predictors of environmental impact. Um, a Ouija board might be better in some <laughs> cases. And so what we need as a society is we need better evaluation of the actual environmental impacts of the materials because that's what we're trying to reduce. We, wanna, we need to measure what it is we're trying to manage, and we're not doing that right now. So we actually have a bill that's working its way through the Oregon legislature right now that would provide some resource to allow us to start doing more of that work, um, which is about 30 years overdue, but better late than never, I say. So I'm sorry, I don't know. We need to know, we really need to know. And it may be that the, the dishware you're using is actually a good environmental choice, just not for the reasons that everyone thinks it is. So that's a very unsatisfying answer, I'm sorry, but that's the scientific answer. Yeah. With that, I think we will say thank you to David Alloway. Thanks for listening. This podcast and the Science on Tap events are created by VIA Productions. We have some great topics coming up at our events in the next couple of months, ranging from information on the Portland Harbor Superfund site to sex ed at the molecular level. So if you'd like to find out more about how to attend one of our events, please check out viaproductions.org. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash scienceontaporwa. And the last bit stands for Oregon and Washington. As always, I'd like to say thank you to my volunteers, the Minions. They've been helping me run these events for years, and I couldn't do it without them. The Minions are Scott Fry, Michelle Herman, Jordy Humphrey, Sam Lauk, Rita Nigren, and Stephen Perry, as well as many others who have helped over the years. Thank you so much for everything. Also, a final thank you to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song Mandelbrot Set as our theme music. Shaped box of springs and wire in one badass fucking fractal, and you're just in time.